Good morning. Welcome to introducing Max into a secure environment. Um, my name's Taylor Wolf. I'm a systems engineer here at Jamf. Been with the company for about four years now. And I am here to introduce David Stoichescu from a company called Mandiant. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, we are going to be giving a little background in terms of what Mandiant as an organization does, but at a high level, um, they help other companies and other groups uh, detect, um, contain, and then prevent um, security risks, um, cyber attacks. And so what we kind of wanted to do today was give you some insight into what David's been doing with his Mac population in terms of um, when they're in the line of business they're in, security compliance is kind of number one priority. And especially with a PC-centric company bringing Max in, um, kind of his story of how he brought those Max in, how he proved that compliance, and kind of where he used Casper along the way. Um, so I'm not going to talk much. That's kind of my bit. And I will let David uh, take it from here. And uh, we'll have questions at the end. So just um, let us know what's coming in your minds. This clicker is a bit of a joke, so we're going to do the uh, we're going to do the computer piece. Thankfully, we're close. So my name is David Stoichescu. I'm an applications administrator with Mandiant Corporation. Um, what we do is is interesting. We we respond to threats. Companies get hacked, and um, they'll either call us. Maybe they want to be preventative, or the FBI calls them, tells them, "Hey, you've been hacked." Maybe you should call somebody. You know, your stuff's been out here for quite a while. Most companies have actually been hacked for uh, averages over a year before they even ever find out. So um, makes my job very interesting as part of being in corporate IT. Everything we do um, is super locked down. Everything in our network is treated as if it's on the outside. Um, so when it comes to uh, usability for the users, it makes it very difficult. Why? There's too many passwords. So I'm the guy that does the, uh, the onboarding piece as well for everybody who starts at Mandiant. And um, usually when you know, people come out of that onboarding room, they're just spinning like tops. They're just like, I don't know what passwords for what. And I said, we just got done saving those 12 passwords. And I showed you how to use Keychain. Um, and so people get just really baffled. Um, and it just makes our job very, very difficult. What I want to do right now, I'm going to show you guys a quick video of what it is we do. Mandiant is the only company that can answer the question, are you currently compromised? And what is the material impact of that compromise? There's no such thing as perfect security. You have to be able to detect, respond, and contain attacks on a daily basis. That's what our products do. Security breaches are inevitable, but being a headline is not. It's not a realistic objective to think that you can stop all intrusions. It is realistic, however, to think that you can find intruders when they breach your defenses and then do something about it before they're able to steal your data. How did they get in? What did they access? What data did they steal? You've got to be able to fully scope the event so then you can take action to contain it. Two of the most important types of attackers are those who are motivated by financial means, such as organized crime, and those who have economic espionage as their motivation, such as a nation state attacker. They're targeted at you, specifically. The attacker has a desire to enter your environment and steal your IP, your money. So the attacks are highly tailored, uh, they're highly customized, and those tend to be very effective at bypassing traditional security controls. You typically have a person at a keyboard somewhere else. That person is taking actions against your company. It's not a piece of malware, it's not a worm or a virus. When Mandiant finds an attack in one customer, we're able to take that intelligence, embed it into our products and services, and put it to work for the benefit of all of our customers. When attacks get through, the question everyone asks themselves is now what? 
One of the unique things about Mandian's products is the ability to rapidly assess tens or hundreds of thousands of systems, identify compromise so you know exactly where to focus. Many companies think that finding the malware is the major problem. In reality, it's about finding all evidence of compromise. Response teams can't be everywhere, but our technology can. Mandiant finds intruders that other companies can't. At the end of every day, Mandiant feels a great sense of pride that we're on the front lines helping organizations safeguard their intellectual property. Cool place to work, right? It's what we do. We have uh, hackers that work for us. We have uh, software analysts work for us. Uh, work for us. We have uh, developers. So, um, you know, aside from the fact that everybody wants a Retina because they think their job is just, you know, that great, um, and they just need all this horsepower, um, it's 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 very interesting, to say the least. So, security, it's. Um, it's what we always think about, everything that we do. So a little history um, about where we, what, where we started and where we're at today. Um, we started giving people a choice. And um, currently, we have six uh, laptop platforms for 99.9% .9 laptops in our enterprise. And um, every, every machine that we, that we give out is fully spec'd out for everybody. And, we said, OK, well, we're going to start giving, uh, we're going to give out Apple computers. And it first started out with you know, a few people, and then it kind of turned into a few dozen, and uh, then in the hundreds. So it, it turned into you know, you're using these small homegrown, um, homegrown solutions to manage these machines, um, or if that's what you want to call it. And, um, and now you need something that is more enterprise. Um, something that does what you need and something that is um, compliant with your security standards. So it uh, started out with uh, one of my two bosses, who's also our uh, general counsel and lawyer. And uh, he walked into my, <laughs> my cube and he says to me, I need to be able to report on who's encrypted uh, on the Mac side. And I, you know, I said, according to our security policy, they're all supposed to be encrypted. But you know, I, I don't know. I, can't, I don't have the answer to that question. Um, you know, we certainly encrypt computers for users when they come on board. But uh, there are some occasions where you know, computers um, you know, have to get wiped. They get uh, replaced. Um, and and you know, especially the remote guys, we, you know, they, go to, they go get a new computer or get shipped to them. And um, you know, we, we, don't, we can't ensure that they're fully compliant. We have no way of reporting on that. So this is what it stemmed out from. It stemmed out from us wanting to meet that need and just report. And then you know, we said to ourselves, well, we have all these other issues with these machines. We can't really manage anything on them. You know, if, we, if we do report on them, can we also do anything about it? Can we encrypt these disks? That's really the most important thing. We, really, we don't care about the hardware. We don't care if it gets lost or stolen. We just want our data to be secure. We don't want anyone to get at it. That's the most important part. We don't really, we're not trying to focus on the, recovery, on the recovery side. So then we want to solve some other problems. So some of the other issues that we had um, were you know, we wanted to collect inventory on licensed software. right? So Microsoft calls us, says, how many, this is Microsoft, how many, how many of these licenses for Office do you have? And I go, I don't, I don't know. Um, you guys want to come down and you guys want to come down and, 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 and check our computers? Yeah, we have about 75 people that are remote. Can you guys do those guys too? And that didn't go over too well. So, you know, so then we started. We had this need. Uh, it wasn't as big as the encryption piece because everything the lawyer guy says is probably the most important part. Um, you know, but then one of my other bosses, and we need a report on that. At the same time, um, you know, we talked about the encryption part. Um, you know, 10.8 had come out, and we're like, okay, we want to deploy a new operating system. And <laughs> what's really funny about that is. We started handing out thumb drives to people with 10.8. God only knows if it was licensed correctly, right? So we're giving out these thumb drives to people. Some work, some don't. 
So it's like now we have a bunch of people running 10.7, we got a bunch of people running 10.8. Uh, all these thumb drives are, you know, this guy's taking it home, plugging it into his wife's computer. Yeah, I got an upgrade. So, uh, you know, you got, a lot of, you got a little bit of that going on. Um, homegrown, right? It's just not the way to do it. So we're looking, we're looking for solutions to all, the, all these different problems. Um, one of the other big <laughs> issues that we had was uh, our imaging piece. Um, it took forever to manage to, to, to image these computers, um, and it 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 didn't work for us. Especially as as we got um, bigger, it started getting a lot more difficult to image uh, lots of computers um, and have what we call dynamic images. So we use a product called Clonezilla at the time. Uh, it's a free piece of software. Um, it did one thing, as far as we were concerned. It did it okay, was it put an image on a computer. Now you gotta realize, I'm a Windows admin. You know, everyone on my team, they're more or less Windows admins, and um, they don't really like to talk about Apple. So I'm a bit of a black sheep, and um, I recently got into this game, so I'm not as experienced or well-versed as a lot of the people here who've been using uh, Apple products for a very long time. So I recently got into it, and I'm coming from that mentality of, the consumer mentality, um, I, have a, I have an Apple at home, and it works very well. But I'm a Windows admin, I love Windows stuff, but why don't I use one of those at home? Well, to me, it just really sucks. And the reason it sucks is because it has so many problems. Um, sure, I can get my applications running, I mean, I have to run Parallels on my Mac to get some of my Windows stuff working, um, but my computer, it, even for an IT person who knows what they're doing, it's like, it still crashes. You, you still have hangups. Backups sort of kind of work half the time. Um, and I was like, you know what? I have the option to switch to a Mac. I'm gonna go ahead and do it. So now I'm thinking from a user standpoint. Everything that I do as an applications administrator, my job is to think like the user. I try to make the job for the users very, very easy. You gotta realize why people are buying Macs, right? They want something that's simple to use and it works all the time. That's why they're buying them. And if I go adding steps to people when they use their computer, if I start um, adding more layers to it and adding bloatware to their machines, it's, it's, it's gonna degrade that quality and that experience. With this product, we had a big issue. The images were static. So we're pushing out stuff. Uh, you know, we really couldn't update anything unless we pushed it out to like a test machine, upgrade different pieces of software, uh, the operating system, and uh, recaptured it. And, and put it out there. Um, you gotta realize we have offices throughout the United States and Europe, and um, you know, maintaining these images on these silly hard disks and sending them out to people is a nightmare. And you know, the reason it was like this is because nobody was thinking on an enterprise level uh, with the Mac, so nobody ever got to that point where it's like, let's start taking these people seriously. It's 60% Mac now and 40% PC. Everybody we go on board, we get that chance to, to switch. They're like, hey, I, I, will, I always wanna try a Mac, let's go ahead and do it. We had a boot from a CD, uh, kind of lame, took forever to boot that piece up, and then you hook it up to an external hard drive, or you can also point it to, um, to a network location for all your images, and it wiped the entire hard disk. So again, we're taking a perfectly good operating system from a new machine, we're blowing it away, and there's like you know, 12, 13 uh, builds for 10.8, and then we're putting on one build, we hope it works. And sometimes, most of the time it would work, some machines would just like not boot, um, so we'd have to create you know, different, different packages for those. So that, then you had to maintain all these different images. So lots of data. Um, so lots of data means lots of time and uh, network degradation. So, so all the users that were accessing that share where these things were at, or even on that same network, they're experiencing performance issues. So we had to do this stuff off hours. And uh, to do about 20 computers at once, um, it took, I wanna say about, six, seven hours. Um, so it's just a painstaking process and just um, at, the, at the rate that we bring on new hires, it's just, it, it's impossible to, to maintain. And it took a team of people to do it. So now we have, um, now we have PCs and Macs in our enterprise. And what do I want? Well, I come from a Windows environment, so I'm gonna tell you what I want in Windows Works. I want manage updates like WSUS for Windows. 
so I can push out uh, updates to whatever machines that, that I have tested, make sure they work, push them out. I want to deploy software images via netboot, like SCCM and Pixie booting for Windows. So again, Pixie booting is like netbooting on the Mac. You can push out custom images with SCCM, uh, super tailored, customized. You got to realize SCCM is a big piece of software. It's difficult to manage and maintain, uh, and, is not, and is often done by uh, a group of people, not one person. Now, I want to manage drive encryption keys uh, and reporting like BitLocker for Windows. Again, BitLocker, just like File Vault, it's built into the OS, it's core, um, and it works most of the time. So that's, you know, that's pretty good. And um, I want to deploy apps. We can do that with SCCM as well. Um, it works very well. You can, you can customize your applications and put them out there for users. And I want to manage things like wipe lock and uh, help users when they need it most with some sort of remote control app. Microsoft does have some tools. Um, I wouldn't call them enterprise. And it's not something that I can rely on. Um, and we're, we're looking to move to uh, products that are robust. So Microsoft really wasn't helping there. And um, you know, when you call them and say, hey, I need this, you get some guy in India who's level three and he doesn't really know what he's talking about and um, trying to get somebody who can help you is really quite difficult. So we started looking around. Um, I remember when I, I, was, I was at an Apple store and um, I was getting a laptop fixed and uh, somehow, the Apple genius managed to talk me into talking to one of their business guys. I had checked this little checkbox that says you're here for business. So I was like, shit. So now I got to talk to this guy. So I'm like, what's this guy going to sell me? So I was like, all right, we do have all these issues. Let's see if Apple can help me resolve them, right? Um, so right now I'm kind of I'm at this point where I'm like, okay, I know, you know Apple's really into the consumer base. I don't really see them on the business side, but you know, let's see what they do. So I get in touch with these guys. Uh, we end up having a meeting. I get my boss down there, another one of my applications administrators, and we're talking about what Apple can do for us. And the system engineer that we spoke to, who was 20, 25 years on the job, you know, he said, Apple's not really going in this direction. There really isn't much we can do for you, and not a solution that's going to fix all your problems. So we're going to recommend this product called Casper. Now, at this point, I was already on this Cloud9 kind of thing. And I was like, just coasting, going through the motions. You know, like when you're having a sales thing with somebody, you're sitting there like, okay, what's this guy trying to sell me? I'll go ahead and listen to everything he's got to say, and then I'm gonna get out of here. So the guy's talking to me about it, and I'm like, okay, I wrote down the information. I went back to my office, and I don't think I ever heard from the guy again. But I started looking for solutions to solve my problem, and one of the solutions that I looked at was Casper. Um, Apple does switch gears. So they're starting, to, they're starting to focus more on the consumer base, and we wanted something that can help us manage the enterprise piece of uh, the Apple side of um, our enterprise. Some products that we looked at, um, they focused on imaging Macs more efficiently, but the deployment of apps was limited, if there at all. Um, some focused on File Vault 2 encryption, but there are too many stipulations. So I remember trying out uh, PGP, they had issues with you know, coming out with a new release for a new operating system. It took them like you know, five, six, seven months to do that. Try another product, McAfee, it's for Mac. Huge joke. They didn't even have an installer for the Mac side. Um, we just weren't willing to create one. And then even if we did, since everyone's an admin on their machines and we don't have you know, remote access to them, how are we going to push this out to them? It adds another layer of... Um, of security to the machine, I suppose, where there's a pre-boot logon. So you gotta type in another username and another password. So now there's two passwords your computer, um, you need for your computer. And it just makes, it, it gets rid of that, it, it degrades that experience that the users have. So we wanted to utilize File Vault. That's what I wanted to do. We did find some do-it-yourself open source solutions, but support yourself. Weren't interested. Found some hybrids, they did both, but Obviously, they were just focused on the, on the PC side, and the Mac was like, eh, we know you, you may have Macs, and you can kind of do some stuff with them. Go ahead and try this. <laughs> um, and they weren't really selling that part. They were just selling the, they were just selling the, uh, the Windows part. So I remember looking at Casper. I was looking at their site, and I was going through the feature set. 
And the first, the, the first couple of features just, just rang all my bells. And I was like, this is exactly what I want. I want drive encryption. I'm able to deploy up the custom applications. And I want to do reporting. Um, those are all things that I wanted. Um, app deployment, and, and it did, uh, the other big thing that it did is uh, it, it did imaging. And again, I'm thinking like, right, Norton Ghost times, I can totally you know, do these computers and I can put images on them. That's what I want, right? Well, not so much. So um, we decided to go with the product and uh, we did the C I did the CCA course and it was, it was really a great idea. After I did the CCA course, the very next day I got back, uh, we had Jumpstart engineers um, at our place doing, uh, doing the install. Um, what was nice about doing the CCA course right before is I was really intimate with the software and I knew exactly what everything was. And during the install, um, the relationship between the installer and myself was very good and we're on the same page and I knew what he was doing. Um, so I had it set up exactly the way I want. So it was really nice. We started creating a NetBoot environment um, and setting up um, apps. Uh, straight away, we created File Vault, um, encryption keys, and started getting, make, you know, being able to report on people, getting everyone managed. Now, from start to finish, the um, deployment of Casper took about uh, a month, and we had a security review which, um, which took a couple of months, and that's just because nobody wanted to devote any time. And they're more or less you know, working on another project, so I had to kind of steal time from, from our engineers, programmers, and developers um, so they can, they can test out this software, make sure it's compliant with our needs. Now, as you may imagine, for a security company, everything we do is locked down. So every time we get a new product or we think about a new product, it goes through this entire phase. I mean, you can ask, uh, you can ask Taylor uh, from Jamf. I mean, I remember working with him, and it just took forever because we had to go through every bit of it and make sure that it meets our needs and that it's secure. Um, right now, we have for all of the offices in the U.S. and uh, in Europe, we have one Mac Mini JSS server with a backup database as well, um, and distribution points throughout. Now I look forward to uh, checking out the new JDS feature in version nine and getting some use out of that. But it's what we're doing right now and it works very well. Um, I can push out anything to anyone and based on the location and some of that information, I can push out those packages to them and it, and it's, it goes to them very, very quickly. So very eager, very excited. As a matter of fact, um, I mean, I have a lot of responsibilities at Mandiant, but uh, I started spending 100% of my time on this product, and I was just really excited about it. And I'm just like, man, this is so much better than the Windows administration I have to do. So I started really digging into it, getting really excited. Um, I overlooked a few things, um, some of which the, uh, the quick add package um, is self-signed. So of course, with Gatekeeper on 10.8, you know, we really didn't want people to disable that. Yeah, we can argue about um, its effectiveness, but we, uh, nonetheless, we didn't really want to disable it. We didn't want people to circumvent it. So we, um, we decided to get a developer certificate so we can sign that package so people can run it on their machines without any problems. We applied for a third-party certificate for JSS, and uh, this helps us prevent man-in-the-middle attacks uh, in comparison to the self-signed cert that is used for that client to server connection. Management password. So again, all of our machines, everyone's admins on their machines. Um, whenever Casper needs to make changes to a machine, it needs some sort of management account. Since we can't provide credentials for that management account because we don't know them, it has to create a new one. And that account has a password. Now, by default, it sets a password. It's always that password. Works very well. Has this JSS has this great feature where you can change that management account password. It's very easy to set up. I'm actually going to go through that a little bit later. And what that does is you got hundreds of computers. You go in there and you say, hey, I want an X amount character password on each computer that's totally random, that I don't know, that changes on whatever frequency that you want. And it's different for each machine. And it's hashed in the JSS database. So it makes it very secure. Um, and 
you know, none of your admins can go in there and, you know, oh, I have this password to this guy's machine. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to start doing all this stuff. So, really cool. One of the downsides, still kind of trying to sort this out. You know, like I said in the beginning, we, 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 we really wanted to report on File Vault. Then it kind of turned like, okay, let's control the keys to the kingdom. You know, we have a disgruntled employee that leaves uh, or something. We can't get into the machine. If we had the key, we can unencrypt that drive. We have this huge forensic process, it takes forever. But we get all, you know, we take a copy of the machine and um, we put that in forensics. But it's kind of useless if we can't unencrypt that drive. So one of the issues that you have is computers are already encrypted. You can report on it, say it's encrypted, um, what technology it's using, but you really can't get in there um, if, if you don't have the password to that machine. So what you have to do is unencrypt it and uh, re-encrypt it with your file vault configuration profile. So we're going to start deploying some images. That's what I thought. So when I went to the uh, CCA course, I was like, man, I'm going to start learning how to deploy images. And that, that's like, because it was like such a big part of my job. It's like, I'm going to totally solve that problem. And I'm not going to have to deal with it anymore. And um, I was wrong about that. Um, for starters, I really have an image of a computer in about a year. Um, everything that we do now is what I call thin imaging. So I'm going to give you my definition of these. So uh, we're on the same page. Thick imaging for me is blowing away an entire hard disk and laying down a static image to that hard disk. A thin image is leaving the operating system from the factory intact and adding what you need in terms of applications and configuration profiles on top of that. Thin imaging provides you um, a way to dynamically install apps and configuration profiles without erasing the disk. That saves you some time. Um, it also ensures that the operating system that's on that computer is the correct operating system, um, and you're not going to have any uh, issues with it. Thick image, you can erase the entire disk, puts on your image. Again, we talked about this before. It's static. So everything that you do on there, if, if you want to update that image, you, know, you have to figure out how to do that, and that just takes more time. Thin imaging provides more flexibility while taking less time and less network resources. So from 45 minutes to deploy a Mac to now 10 minutes per Mac um, with about you know, 6 gigs of data, and just a minute of that is usually, you know, interaction with that computer. So I would really call this light touch thin imaging. And um, so it doesn't take, up, doesn't take up all those network resources. And uh, with Casper, both can be automated. You can do it with NetBoot or with self-service. Um, our approach is self-service. So we like to, again, we want to keep that consistency and user experience for Macs. You know what? You guys are in control. You guys have self-service. You can do everything you want with it. So it comes in really, really handy. So we started getting some apps out there. We first started out with like a managed antivirus software. Uh, we didn't have that before. We were just kind of handing out antivirus software to the people and giving them the license keys. Pray and hope they don't use it you know, for someplace else um, on, their, on their other machines um, and kind of hope that they have the right profiles um, on their antivirus software. Um, so what we did is we, did, we, we set up a server and you know, we can now manage all of the settings and we have different profiles for you know, different parts of the company when it comes to antivirus. Uh, we can deploy licensed copies of Office and Infusion, for instance. Comes in really, really handy. Now we can keep track of licensing. So when Microsoft does call us, we can tell them exactly how many we have of what version. And uh, up-to-date browsers uh, comes in really, really handy when you're uh, putting, you know, getting new people in your company and you want to show them all of the, uh, you know, give them all your websites. Um, you know, all the helpful things, you know, sure, everything's on an internal site someplace they can access with another set of credentials, but it's kind of nice to have everything at their fingertips. And during the setup process, there's so many links that we go through for setting users up. Um, you know, we just kind of, we used to have them just, you know, copy them from a piece of paper and just type them in there. And uh, now everything's preset and uh, the onboarding process is uh, significantly smoother and a much better experience for our users. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go over capturing some packages, um, deploying them to, to uh, some machines. Um, we're going we're to install Adobe Reader version 10. We're going to capture that, put it in Casper Admin, deploy it to a machine. Then we're going to update 
We're going to go from version 10 to version 11. I'm going to show you how simple that is. Now, please keep in mind what we're doing is a sky high overview of how to do this. Um, in a production environment, you're going to do more testing um, and um, uh, sifting through your package sources and composer before you actually push them out or, or, or create DMGs out of them. We're going to install a managed ESET antivirus with custom settings and verify that's working, create a policy for that. And uh, we're actually going to go through setting up File Vault, again, sky high overview, and um, uh, account management password change. One thing I'd like to note is um, the screenshots that you guys are seeing here are VMs on my laptop. And what's nice about that is I don't have to have these other pieces of hardware that I'm doing all my testing on. So um, I have you know, one of the Retina machines. It's got all kinds of uh, power under the hood, so I can run many, many VMs. And I have snapshots of everything. So you know, I, I'll have one that is clean, or I use that as, um, as a staging. I'll have one that's just a master that has all the different uh, Casper uh, suite applications installed. Um, and then I'll actually have production VMs. And those are VMs that are copies of uh, actual running machines with everything else installed. So once I test that application, figure out that it does exactly what I want, I like to push it to these, to these VMs that are production and make sure they don't clash with anything else. So again, what you're about to see um, are these VMs. So again, using Composer, we're going to capture a package, create a DMG, upload it to Casper admin application, sign in a category, index the package, um, and then sign uninstall. So the category, um, it's always nice to have. It's required for our applications to be in self-service. Index, what that does, again, you've got to realize we're not really installing packages. We're more or less laying them down on machines. So what that does is it takes note of every piece that's put where. So if we want to remove that in the future, it's going to grab them from those exact locations. And last but not least, in the package properties, we, install, we set the uninstall option. And what that does, it just gives us the option when we're later in the JSS, creating a policy, is to uninstall that package. And uh, yeah, save your work when you're done. So we're going to launch Composer on this machine. And this is just one of the couple ways of creating uh, these snapshots. We're going to give this a name. And we're going to take a snapshot of the PC. And it's so fast. And now we can go ahead and perform our installation. So I've pre-downloaded version 10. And we're going to run through this installer very quick. Put that new computer through its paces and justify that purchase. It wasn't just for the screen, I promise. So it was really quick, right? It's totally worth the money. So now we're taking that second snapshot. So what Composer does is it takes the two, compares the differences, and it makes that a source. So I'm going to take that source, and we're going to convert that as a DMG. And again, in a production environment, you're probably going to do more sifting through the package source contents, make sure that there's something in there that you don't need. We're launching the Casper admin application. We're going to upload that DMG file to it. Assign it to a category. Now, what we're also going to do is we're going to index that package. We talked about that earlier. We're going to give it um, a different uh, priority. Now, the default priority is 10. I made that a 9. So when we later upgrade this package, it's going to run before the install of the new version. So now we're going to upgrade from version 10 to version 11. Uh, we're going to use self-service. The version 10 has already been deployed to another VM. And I've created a version 11 install in the same, same manner. And what we're going to do right now is, um, is deploy that.
So we're creating a new policy. This is going to be the version 11 upgrade. Give it a category. And for uh, demonstration purposes, we're going to set this to ongoing so we can run as many times as we like. We're going to assign the packages. You see we have a version 10 and a version 11. A version 10, we set a priority later, so it's going to run first. And we gave it the uninstall option because we did that earlier in Casper Admin. We indexed it. We're going to add our new package. This is going to be the version 11. And that's just going to have a default install option. As far as scope is concerned, again, for demonstration's sake, we're going to apply that to all machines. And we're going to make this uh, available in self-service. So what does that look like? So I have version 10 already installed. I'm going to verify the version. It's version 10. We'll launch the uh, self-service application. And um, let's go ahead and upgrade to version 11. So this is something the user may be doing when they want to upgrade. Of course, you have some fancy icons up there, too. You can see that the policy succeeded. We can now launch that application and see that it upgraded to the new version. And you're running version 11. So Casper makes that really easy. Of course, as I said before, you're going to do more testing in a production environment. You do more sifting of package sources. But I did all that 10 minutes. So it's very, very quick very efficient, um, and it works very well. Users are happy. They have that portal. They get those apps. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about managed antivirus. We're going to capture a configured install. Uh, in this case, we're going to use ESET antivirus. We're going to set a management server name. And uh, we're going to sign all users to the admin group. So what that's doing is we're going to say, hey, the mothership is here talk to this. And we're going to give the users the ability to be admins on their own machines. When it comes to their antivirus, you're going to realize we're working in a security business. We have sometimes people are running malware on their own machines um, in one way or another in a secure fashion. And um, you know, ESET may, uh, may not like that. So you've got, you got to figure out a way to turn that off, let them turn it off uh, when they need to. We'll launch Composer again. My super secret password. It's totally compliant. Eight characters. <coughs> We're going to take that before snapshot of the computer. And now we can perform our installation. Now, again, we talked, this, we talked about this earlier. I mean, when, you're given, when we used to give people these, these installers, they used to just give them the license keys, and you kind of hoped and prayed that they set it up right. Um, who knows what kind of settings they had. Maybe they installed it, and it really wasn't active. It's was disabled all the time. So when we set the uh, administration or management parameters, uh, we, can, we can look at our, our, our database or our management server, and we can see exactly who's running it, who's up to date, who's got what. Uh, if they're infected, um, it's, as a matter of fact, our security team knows somebody's infected before they even get a pop-up. Uh, that's how scary it is. I remember I went to, uh, just last week, I went to download a, uh, an application from a trusted site. Um, and I, I went and downloaded the application. It was, it went, the install went totally fine. And um, five minutes, I get a call from our security guy. Um, and he, he says to me, it, you have a virus on this machine with this host name. And I look at the host name. Of course, we have these super cryptic host names. Um, they mean something to us. They mean nothing to everyone else. And I, 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 I look at them. I'm like, oh, well, that's this computer. And another 10 minutes later, I get a pop-up from the antivirus. We may have found something fishy, but we think it's OK. And uh, it wasn't. What we did here is we set that server name, and we set the users to be able to be their own admins um, on their antivirus software. And now we're going to perform that. We're going to we perform that installation. We managed it, and now we're going to 
take a picture of that. So now we're going to deploy it. We're going to test, it, test those configuration settings, make sure that they actually took on, uh, on, a, on an end user's computer. Launching self-service. And there's our managed ESET antivirus install. That was so fast. Reboot the machine. Antivirus should pop up. And let's check those management settings, see if they took. So now I didn't give anybody any keys. I didn't give them an installer. I didn't have to tell them the server name or any other settings. And I made sure that they can uh, turn off or scan their own machine uh, whenever they need to. And it's working correctly. So now we're going to go uh, over Fall Vault 2. Again, this is a sky high overview. Um, set that up and the management account password change. In all reality, you would probably use your own policy to set this up. What I've done is I've piggybacked on the update policy, which runs every 15 minutes. You don't want to do this in your environment. You want to you know, have something that runs um, every week or something that changes that password. And uh, again, dynamic passwords for each computer. No one's got the same password. It's hashed in the JSS database. So under management settings, we're going to create a disk encryption configuration profile. Give this a fancy name. We're going to select our uh, key type. In this case, we're going to do individual. And we're going to tell them to run on the current or next user. Now we're going to create a policy to deploy that. Something descriptive, of course. And we're going to apply that configuration profile that we made earlier. There it is. And again, for demonstration's sake, we're going to assign this to all machines and um, put it in a self-service policy. Now, at least in my environment, when I, when I set up new machines, instead of having a bunch of different policies, I'll have one policy for a complete new deployment, which has everything in it. Um, all the different configuration profiles, all the different managed applications, they all run in order, um, and they all run with it just clicking one button. So now we've encrypted this computer. You can see since it was set to run once, it ran on that machine and disappeared. Now we're going to reboot that computer. And it's asking for the user's password so it can access the keychain uh, file and add those encryption keys to it. When this computer boots back up, it's going to be encrypting. On a regular hard drive, it takes about uh, eight hours on a 750 gig disk. And it looks like it takes about uh, 25 minutes on the uh, retinas and about 45 on the airs. So um, it encrypts relatively quickly. And those keys are now stored in the JSS database. Now, some admins have access to those keys, and uh, the technicians do not. So you know, somebody leaves the company, the computer gets submitted to forensics. I type in that key instead of the password, and the computer gets um, unlocked. Um, and I can then unencrypt their disk and uh, push out that image to, to a, a forensic system. So it's very, very effective. Um, this is just one way of doing it. Um, there's also the institutional method as well. So like I said before, we're going to piggyback on this update inventory. I'm just going to show you how easy it is to set up the account management password change. So we're going to go to Edit and Management Account. And we're going to configure this for a randomly generated password of 32 characters. That's it. Any computer that runs that policy, the management account password will change to something dynamic. In this case, every 15 minutes, which is super overkill. Um, but it works, it works very well.
So some to-dos for later. Third-party certificate for JSS. This helps you prevent man-in-the-middle attacks in the communication between your computer and your server. Apple development certificate for your QuickEd package. This will help bypass the gatekeeper annoyances, of course. You can set up a DMZ machine with folders to the internal JSS database. So again, it doesn't have to have its own database. It just kind of points to the inside. Um, and this is great for people that are not on the VPN. They're not on the same network. You can also disable the front-end interface so um, APIs won't work and, um, and user logins from the outside are also disabled. It's really neat. Push certificate using JSS. Um, this will enable the MDM. So what's nice about MDM is it comes from Apple to your client machines, and it locks, wipes the computer. Um, it's, it's really nice because it's, it's darn near instant. It works uh, very well. There's no other holes you have to poke in the machine's firewall to enable that feature. I do appreciate you guys uh, listening in on this today. Again, this was our experience, how we use this software, and uh, what it does for us. It's, it's been a godsend, and um, I really do appreciate um, all the help that Taylor has given me um, at Jamf. I mean, every time I have an issue, I'm able to uh, just call in. It's really nice to just bypass the board, just go straight to him. I'm sure it's not allowed. But uh, anyways, he's able to give me all the support I need and really everything that we've ever needed, um, we've been able to do with this product. It's worked very well for us. So right now we have a few minutes for uh, Q&A. If anyone has uh, any questions. Yes? Any reason for that so we read a package, you just didn't use the package? I'm um, the question was, any reason you didn't use the Adobe Reader or what? The package. Just from the third-party installer? So the, the package from the third-party installer, what that does is it, is it installs the software in its most basic way, just as normal any, any user would be able to. What's <laughs> nice about that is when we package it up for them, we can usually install our machines, do any other updates there is, and bypass the, like, the license agreement stuff and all that fun stuff. So when they launch it, it just comes straight up. Uh, yes. A couple questions. Um, I didn't hear you talk about like a HIPS management or app firewall. I don't know what you guys were doing with that. Um, I'm are sorry? Using the, are you using the internal app firewall? Are you using a third party firewall? Because I know ESA doesn't have a uh, enterprise management for the uh, firewall piece. So I'm not sure about the the ESET management on the firewall. I know that they have a smart security software, which we don't utilize. Um, like, I, like I explained before, we let people be their own admins on their machine. And you gotta realize the people that work for us, they're, they're all focused towards security, and that's kind of what, they, they wanna have that full control over their machines. So a lot of them have a lot of third party stuff going on, and when we put our own things on there, it interferes with it. And it's just proven to be a headache in the past. So you're not, are you not enabling the app firewall at all? No. Okay. A couple of questions. First, you said you were a Microsoft shop. So interested to know if, um, if you domain joined your Macs, if you use the SCCM plugin um, that, ca that comes with Casper. And the second question is, you mentioned that if, if your users um, re-image their machines, you can't confirm that FileVault is there. If they re-image their machines, how can you ensure that they are still communicating with Casper to protect the, the file vault settings? So first question, um, I'm not at liberty to discuss. The second question, um, if a user does not report into JSS, they automatically get added to a smart group, which sends us an email. So that tells me that this person hasn't checked in in over two weeks, and they've either been fired without my knowledge, or they've re-imaged their machine. Or they're just lazy. Yes? Any tips on uh, coercing people into encrypting the machine since it's in self-service? And... OK. Uh, the question is how to get your users to encrypt. If it's in self-service, still, it still requires them to do something. So what we like to do is we throw the compliance email out there. And we usually send it from our lawyer so it's, you know, it's, got some, it's got some weight behind it. But we really can't force people. So if they're not compliant, 
with our policies. Then they have a serious sit down with some, with some people that do that kind of thing. Um, so we, we, we take it very seriously. It gets to a point where people are just so controlling over their own machines and their environment that we have no choice but to disrupt that experience that they want and say, you know what, you have to, you have to do this. Um, and we usually go through this every once in a while. There are people that like to reimage their machine like every month. And it provides, it, it creates a headache for us. So what we do with those people is we say, hey, if you're gonna reimage your machine, what I want you to do is go out to Apple servers, do a network boot, pull down, pull down the latest image for your machine, and then manage your computer, and uh, they can authenticate to the JSS site with uh, multiple sets of credentials. And, and just kind of on that same topic, um, one of the, the creative ways I've seen to force people to get encrypted is you know, when you spin up a new JSS, you have all managed clients. Edit that smart group a little bit so that it's a managed client and it's encrypted, and no software is made available to you until that machine is actually encrypted. So. As soon as they fall into that smart group, they have the entire catalog of software made available. Now, thanks them. for noticing that. Would have been nice to know, <laughs> like, a couple of months ago, right? That's a really good idea, right? So you take away everything unless they do one of the most important things. Any other questions? Absolutely not. And Dave. Uh, yeah. The question was: Was there is SSH enabled? Just so want to make sure everybody can hear this. We, we, we don't do it. Um, you got to realize most of the places that we deal with, they have an AD environment, and uh, they're compromised, and it's a common denominator. It's like most of the people that we that that, that call us, they have an AD environment, and they become compromised, and uh, a lot of times it's not that AD is bad, it's that it was misconfigured. Anybody can just install AD, next, 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 finish, and it works, right? Well, not all the time. I mean, there's a certain level of expertise that goes behind setting it up correctly, uh, efficiently, and securely. And there needs to be um, a lot of uh, security controls and redundancies in place for that to happen. Um, we have the unique, um, that unique skill set of people that work for us, um, lots of, uh, uh, what are they, uh, Windows uh, domain architects, and um, it, it, it's, it's very handy, it, help, it helps us. So we know what not to do because we see it everywhere else. Uh, SSH is compromised on a regular basis in our travels. Some more, yes? So um, this would be from experience. Um, usually, uh, the majority of the time, it's emails, right? Somebody sends you an email, you click on something, and somebody gets access to your credentials. They do what's called a, um, they, 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 they hash your password. They can move loudly with the network, and they can elevate their, their credentials by getting other stored admin credentials on other machines. So there's ways of mitigating that as well, but it's not my area of expertise to talk about. Yes? Absolutely, and I agree with what you're saying. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, you know, we've only had this for a year, and you gotta realize where we've come from is just, we haven't done, we just started to get into, you know, let's take the Mac seriously, and that is uh, something that we've already done. We, uh, we had a similar situation at my university where all windows. We have the only large Mac deployment anywhere. For security, our security group is all windows server, everything. They don't take Mac security seriously. So we had to become experts very quickly. We actually ended up running Debian headless 
Secure Shell learned it from the ground up in terms of how to work in Linux. And a lot of that stuff translated over to Mac OS X for security policies. And there's so much more documentation at an enterprise level for those types of systems. And we went with that because it helped us learn security from a very ground level. And it actually changed how we think about Casper and how we implement it for security policy. So that's one of the things, just to mention anyone in this room who may be looking at it, it was very helpful for our shops and security. There's a lot of things that you know, Windows admins do are very good. There's no problem with it. But when you actually start understanding how Keychain actually works and how these security paradigms function, you start reevaluating how you even do your encryption algorithms. Because you start seeing, hey, the breaches on Windows are real breaches. The breaches on Mac are different because it is a Unix system. And if you understand that, you can actually track the severity of the leak. I, I agree with what you're saying. A lot of people become comfortable uh, behind those security measures that they have, and they get a little bit too comfortable. And uh, like I mentioned before, what we do is we treat everything like it's in the outside and everything's foreign. So everything has to be trusted uh, at some point when it communicates with one of our servers. So I understand where you're coming from. Anyone else? Yes? Uh, no, um, I don't have the answer to that question. Anyone else? Yes. We had we had an issue with without opening up our whole environment to the 17 network as Apple recommends. So we worked with our uh, network security group to find out exactly where APNS was going internally, and there's a, there's a two or three addresses that it goes to that you could open up your firewall to. So we've more or less decided to just not even do that. Um, if, that, was that was the right, so if our computers are going to be managed by MDM, it's going to be outside the network. So we decided to just not even do it. When it comes to poking holes and um, our, our firewalls, um, <laughs> Everything goes through a huge review process. Everybody's got their two cents. And for the, the benefit of getting that, we decided that it wasn't worth it. Just so, so everybody has questions. It's three URLs and two port, three ports. Right. So it's not open on every single port. It's three specific ports. Right. Two, two, I think it's two specific URLs. Again, yeah. Lots. If anybody's interested. Coming from Apple, is the port server, the uh, addresses that you're currently using, uh, sense of the global service that will randomly So we allow JSS to have that traffic um, only, and it's for computers outside the network. And we're really more or less concerned about computers walking away and just remotely wiping them. We don't even do the lock piece. So. Cool. And um, appreciate all the questions, everyone. I think we're at the very top of the hour, so we're going to cut it off right there. Uh, we'll hang out outside if you, anybody does want to chat about anything afterwards. Uh, thanks again for coming. <laughs>